Wow. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, now we'll, uh, let's move to the, the, uh, the next part is the, the section six with the thermal and the design session. And uh, so the, the first speaker is uh, Srijis Kochu Prako writing. Uh, um, he's the PhD candidate in the School of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, he had received his master's degree in electrical and computer uh, engineering from Georgia Tech in 2016, and the bachelor's degree in electronics and computation engineering from Co uh, Cochin University of Science and Technology, India, in 2009. His current research is focused on uh, developing and eva evaluating uh, various enabling te technologies for interconnection and thermal management issues in uh, advanced 2.5D and 3D heterogeneous integration uh, device. So uh, let's welcome uh, Srijis. And Srijis, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wei. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'd be uh, talking on our work on the electrical and performance benefits of advanced monolithic cooling for 2.5D heterogeneous ICs. Um, so this is an outline of our talk for the day. So I'd start with an introduction of uh, what are the uh, thermal challenges unique to the 2.5D and 3D integration architectures. Oh, sorry, 2.5D integration architectures. We present some like finite volume modeling based analysis for like both the thermal benefits of monolithic microfluidic cooling as well as like, uh, uh, like theoretical analysis in terms of how this would impact design decisions like die to die spacing. Uh, Sorry, uh, Sridhar, you're sharing the presenter view, not the. Uh... Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay. Another screen. My bad. Sorry. Yeah, um, that's better. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, so. Uh, we uh, show like some uh, finite volume modeling based analysis, and then uh, move on to show the. Um, uh, th uh, thermal benefits of uh, monolithic microfluidic cooling. Uh, we, uh, I show some like experimental demonstrations we have done on like a functional 2.5D IC. We'll uh, present the results in comparison to other work in literature and present our conclusions. Uh, so let's get started with the introduction. Um, so like uh, Dr. Swaminathan was saying in uh, the previous presentation, currently with the slowing down of like uh, performance, uh, like most uh, more scaling, the performance enhancements over gen, uh, like compute generations are not driven just by technology gains anymore. For example, if we look at this uh, like chart uh, given by uh, AMD's Dr. Su in like IEDM 2017, we can see that like uh, technology gains contribute to less than half of the performance improvement uh, coming from uh, coming uh, generation over generation. So if we uh, like the other other part is contributed by things like uh, compiler improvements, like uh, power management, microarchitectural improvements, extra. Of like particular importance in this is uh, for this uh, the purpose of this talk is like the additional TDP and the increase in die size. So one major contributor to like increasing performance these days is like essentially packing more more silicon and like uh, more silicon into the package and. Uh, Dealing with uh, like uh, dealing with a higher TDP coming from it, so as to get like a uh, uh, so as to keep up with the increased performance demand. So if we like project this out based on the IRDS projections, we can see that like the socket TDP powers like the C, uh, for the server sockets is increased to uh, is projected to increase to much higher levels in the next decade or so. So what this means is that like managing this increasing TDP is an integral part of like keeping up with this performance scaling. So we need like uh, new, new and improved thermal management techniques, which can basically ensure that we can deal with this high TDP so as to ensure like this performance scaling, because again, like with the, uh, slow, uh, the ending of denet scaling, most of like a good portion of our performance enhancement is uh, coming from like uh, coming, by, uh, coming by accounting for this increased TDP. So again, like, uh, Let's look in terms of how this additional die size uh, is implemented. So uh, again, uh, going back to the previous presentation as uh, Dr. Swaminathan was alluding to, uh, due to various reasons uh, ranging from cost to like approaching critical size to like um, limitations in like more scaling, 
the industry is moving towards more of a package scaling approach for like uh, packing more silicon into the package rather than like uh, just increasing the die size. So what this means is that like the newer compute devices where this extra silicon overhead is added might be added in terms of like multiple dice integrated in the same package rather than a single large device. So this can be again like a 2.5D in a 2.5D fashion or like a 3D fashion where uh, like dice are interconnected using many of the technologies we saw in the last presentation like embedded bridges, silicon interposers or uh, TSP based bonding. Uh, so again, this is no longer a theoretical concept with almost all the major industry players moving towards more of a, a multi-die approach for the leading edge compute devices. So this means that we need to have like a more detailed look at uh, the scaling the uh, thermal performance in the context of multi-die systems. So if we look at like a conventional uh, conventional multi uh, conventional 2.5D system, here I have uh, illustrated like a bridge-based 2.5D device with two uh, two dice placed right next to each other on a package. Um, two things are evident. So once with the uh, with the like the thermal resistances associated with the conventional heat removal path, including like the multiple thermal interfaces, uh, uh, thermal interface material and heat spreader, etc. We uh, once the TDP increases, we need higher and higher efficiency of cooling solution on the top to remove this extra uh, extra thermal uh, extra power. Second, more interestingly, by placing these dies in close proximity, as uh, is the case with most of these advanced 2.5D integration technologies, we have the potential of thermal coupling between the dies. Thermal coupling. Uh, can occur through any of these shared interfaces or even like uh, uh, from the die, uh, die to die just due to its close proximity. So dealing with both of these approach, uh, both of these problems, like the increased thermal, increased GDP, as well as the increased thermal coupling is of importance for like these uh, 2.5D devices. Uh, so monolithic microfluidic cooling has been like proposed in the past as an approach for like managing with thermals of uh, single die systems. So if we take the same same approach and like you know transfer that to a two point five D device, so basically this involves like etching the heat removal channels directly onto the backside of each of the silicon dice in the package. What we can see is that not only does we improve uh, reduce a lot of the thermal resistive paths, we also cut down a lot on the uh, thermal coupling paths. So from both these aspects, monolithic microfluidic cooling seems like a promising techniques. A pro promising technique for the 2.5D devices. So we get to deal with like the increasing package TDP by reducing the resistances, uh, thermal resistances in the path of heat removal. Uh, we are able to reduce the die to die thermal coupling. And uh, more importantly, we are able to do this in a very small form factor heat sink, again, uh, helping in terms of like uh, increased compute density, et cetera. Um, so, this is like a theoretical overview. So in order to get like a better understanding of how this stacks in a practical system, we did some finite volume based modeling based analysis. Um, so for this analysis, we uh, chose like a older generation AMD Epix Naval processor as the test case. And um, we, uh, from the publicly available data, we uh, chose the corresponding like uh, power densities of each part of the core complex dice. Um, and the dimensions of the uh, package as well as the dies, and <clears throat> use this for uh, like uh, all of our analysis. So this uh, with this power dissipation, we uh, reached close to like a 200 watt power dissipation in the entire package, and we can uh, uh, we compared this for like uh, compared this with multiple cooling solutions. So um, like I said, the first uh, important thing is how like the absolute temperatures of the dice. Uh, fair in with different cooling approaches on the top you can see the results from a conventional air cool heat sink um, as you can see like with, uh, with on the lower uh, lower figure with microfluidic cooling the temperatures reach much lower values compared to uh, air cool heat sink when all the dice are active so basically the higher tdp the uh, high, uh, lower thermal resistance of microfluidic cooling is helpful in like operating your devices at a lower temperature. 
Um, for the second part we were discussing, for the thermal coupling, we did the same analysis, but for this case, we uh, activated only one of the die, in this case, the top left die, and turned off all the other devices. But as you can see, for the air cooled heat sink case, even though the other dies are turned off, we can see like the temperature of the die corners increasing due to like thermal coupling from the other devices. So um, this is like an extreme case we uh, simulated to like illustrate the uh, illustrate the uh, thermal coupling part. But basically, what this means that even during operation, uh, if even though that uh, one one die might be like dissipating a lower power, it still might be operating at a much higher temperature due to thermal coupling from adjacent dies. As you can see with microfluidic cooling, this coupling is reduced to a uh, reduced to a considerable extent. So this is of particular importance when say we are moving from uh, moving towards architectures like memory in package so keeping like a uh, uh, something like a dram which is uh, which has a thermally se uh, sensitive adaptive refresh if we do not manage the thermal coupling we could effectively use uh, loose performance because of the uh, if because of the device being forced to operate at a higher temperature so if we look uh, so this is in terms of like how it would fare with the, with the fixed spacing we had chosen. So the, another thing we wanted to evaluate was how does this, uh, how does this uh, translate to a design trade-off? So we know electrically, uh, from an electrical standpoint, it's always beneficial to keep the dice uh, close to each other. So um, this would give us shorter lengths, uh, low, uh, lower energy per bit of, over the communication. Um, and also give us a much smaller package. So from a performance standpoint, like uh, keeping these dice right next to each other is beneficial, so, but we wanted to evaluate how does this fare thermally. So as expected, um, as the dice spacing increases, both the junction temperature as well as the thermal coupling reduces. But as you can see in this graph, for the air cooling, it's uh, it uh, the thermal coupling as we come clo uh, closer and closer, our, increases quite uh, considerably compared to microfluidic cooling where both the coupling and the absolute uh, absolute junction temperature uh, is much lower. Meaning that like with my monolithic microfluidic cooling, we can actually enable much tighter integration architectures, basically leading to links with superior electrical performance. So um, this gives like a good motivation in terms of like the performance benefits, uh, performance benefits of the uh, uh, like the approach. So we wanted to see the experimental feasibility of demonstration. Uh, so we went ahead with uh, like uh, demonstrating this on an actual functional device. So for this demonstration, we chose uh, Intel Stratix 10 FPGA. So uh, on the left, you can see the uh, an image of the development board with its stock liquid cool heatsink mounted on it. And on the right, you can see like a, a die flow plan and like a delivery die image of the device. So uh, this package consists of like a five five discrete dies. We have like a large center core complex die surrounded by four transceiver tiles on four uh, on on all the corners, uh, connected with the Intel uh, embedded uh, bridge technology. So uh, on this test bed, we went ahead and um, implemented the microfluidic cooling solution. So this is like a, a fabrication and assembly flow we use for the approach. So we started with the packaged FPGA. We removed the heat spreader and the thermal interface material. Uh, and uh, we mounted it on a carrier wafer and uh, use conventional photolithography to pattern our micropane film heat sinks on it. We, uh, we did like an optimized uh, Bosch process etch to pat, uh, like create these micropane fins on the backside of these devices. Put this back on uh, the development board and attach 3D printed capping structures with uh, fluid delivery ports using epoxy for uh, like connection of the, uh, for, for the fluidic connections. So one thing uh, I want to stress over here is that as you can see in this illustration, I've shown different micropin fin dimensions over the uh, FPG region as well as the transceiver region. So this was another design decision we chose uh, to show the uh, enhancements we can bring with microfluidic cooling. Uh, so different dyes in a package can have very different power densities. Um, if we go with uh, an approach like this, we can actually 
tune the thermal performance of the heat sink over different parts of the package. So if we have like uh, in this case, like the transceiver region with much higher power density, we have like a heat sink, which has a much higher cooling efficacy at the uh, cost of like increased pressure drop. So based on the uh, uh, device profile, device power profile and requirements, we can actually tailor the cooling efficiency over different regions of the package. Uh, so here are some images post fabrication. Uh, like I said, like the FPGA region, we have like um, less, uh, less power density. So we have like sparser micropaint fence, whereas the transceiver regions, even though they are smaller, has like much higher power densities. And for that reason, we uh, increase the micropaint fin density over that region. On the right side, we can see some uh, Im uh, images of the uh, device post assembling on the uh, development board. With the, uh, you can see the 3D printed connections we use for uh, uh, fluid inlet and outlets. Um, so I'll show some results from this initial demonstration uh, in terms of both uh, th uh, thermal and like compute performance improvements we, we were able to achieve. Um, so uh, again, for uh, this uh, for this demonstration, we actually used only two of the four transceiver tiles uh, and the center uh, FPGA core. So we had like a one fluid flow path feeding just that uh, FPGA tile and a separate fluid flow path uh, feeding both of the transceivers at the same time. With this approach, we were able to achieve um, a very low junction to, uh, to inlet uh, thermal resistance of 0 0.074 degrees Celsius per watt um, for the large FPGA code die and a, a slightly higher uh, thermal resistance values for the uh, transceiver tiles. On the right, you can see a comparison with the stock heat sink. So as you can see, the absolute junction temperatures are much lower for all values of FPGA core power, as well as like, as you can see, when the FPGA core power is varying with the microfluidic heat sink, the transceiver temperatures do not have the same level of sensitivity as with the uh, stock uh, liquid cooled heat sink. Um, so the same is illustrated in this graph over here. So when the uh, like the uh, when the core power increases from 73 watts to almost 108 watts with the microfluidic cooling, both uh, trans for the both transceiver tiles, the temperature remains mostly constant with uh, microfluidic cooling. But whereas with stock cooling, as the stock temperature increases due to thermal coupling, the transceiver temperatures also have a, a considerable increase. Um, so. This shows the thermal benefits of like uh, this approach. We also wanted to see how the computational benefits, uh, what the computational benefits would be. So uh, we changed the uh, changed the underlying program running on the the benchmark program we created on the FPGA uh, to uh, achieve the same thermal conditions with both uh, solutions. So for the stock heat sink, uh, with uh, uh, we chose like a stable operating point of around 114 watts, which gave these uh, temperature values for each of the three tiles. And to achieve the same value on the, uh, with the microfluidic uh, heat sink, we increased both the core base clock as well as the number of, uh, number of uh, DSP units programmed on the FPGA. So basically we were able to have like a 5% increase in the compute frequency as well as the uh, compute utilization uh, corresponding to a considerable increase in the compute performance while operating at the same stable thermal point. Also, to evaluate how this would, uh, since this was an open low based measurement, we wanted to evaluate how this would uh, work in like a uh, actual closed loop use case. So for that purpose, we used an elevated temperature inlet. So the idea here being like, if we can have good thermal performance while operating at a higher inlet temperature, we can have like more efficient cooling uh, because we don't have to like spend considerable amount of resources in terms of like refrigeration of the uh, refrigeration or heat exchange solutions. So as you can see, we were able to dissipate much higher temperature, much higher powers in the uh, device while operating at the same uh, similar thermal points, even when being cooled with like a elevated temperature inlet solution. Um, so this, uh, we also wanted to uh, say how our work compares to like other approaches uh, reported in the literature. 
So uh, as you can see, like uh, we were able to achieve a very low, very respectable thermal resistance number even uh, when dissipating like a very large amount of power. We also want to point out that this was the first demonstration of monolithic microfluidic cooling on a functional 2.5D device uh, running actual benchmark programs. Um, so again, this, uh, this shows like the work, uh, this approach has quite, uh, quite a lot of scalability potential when it comes to like uh, catering for the demands, uh, catering for the increased demands for uh, increasing uh, TDPs of the 2.5D devices. Um, so in conclusion, um, we were able to uh, demonstrate the thermal and electrical performance benefits of monolithic microfluidic cooling. We used uh, FPM analysis to show the uh, increase in both the thermal performance as well as the uh, how this technology can enable tighter integration for better electrical performance. We were able to demonstrate this on an actual functional 2.5D FPGA and showed like uh, very respectable performance numbers while dissipating like uh, close to 200 watts of uh, package power, uh, showing the ability of this um, approach to scale to um, scale to like much uh, scale to the demands of the increased uh, increased package GDPs. Um, so that's mostly from my side. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarjit. And uh, yeah, uh, very nice talk. And uh, also it's very nice to see uh, my research was also showing in the benchmark chart. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, so if we have any question, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, put your question in the, in the chat. So uh, probably I can ask one question. So uh, which coolant are, are you using in your uh, cooling? Uh, we, we went with DI water. So DI water? Start, yes. Okay. Uh, so basically for the long-term uh, reliability uh, for the device, do, do, is there, are there any risk uh, for the, I mean, the DI water or the coolant directly contact with the semiconductor device for the long-term? Um, th that's, that's definitely an interesting question. So um, I'd say there, there are two potential things we would need to consider when it comes to long-term reliability. So pumping these uh, flu uh, flu uh, fluids right on top of the device is essentially like exerting some stress on the silicon. So we have not done any long-term reliability studies in terms of how this might affect device performance or would lead to potential failures. So that's one area we, uh, we could potentially look into, but uh, from our initial experimentation um, and some simulations some of our colleagues had done in the past, the effect seems to be minimal. And the second, uh, obviously, uh, second, of course, is like the, uh, any effects from the presence of fluid itself, like uh, say effects from uh, potential leakage, uh, which again can cause issues. But um, I would say, yes, it is uh, slightly more risky than like a um, conventional cold plate based approach, but um, this can, uh, uh, this um, from, um, from the work uh, we have done, it seems like this actually can be incorporated without con adding considerable risk to the overall solution. Yeah, yeah, that, I got you. Yeah, basically, uh, my second question is also about the mechanical reliability. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you actually you already uh, addressed this question because uh, when, you, when the flow going through the micro channel or the pillar, there will be uh, the pressure and this can induce the kind of stress. So yeah, a bit. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I see one question from Larry uh, from, uh, in the chat is, what was the water flow rate and the pressure drop? Uh, sure, so uh, for, for, this, uh, for this one, we used like, a, I wanna say, um, uh, like close to uh, 12 liters per hour uh, of like water flow rate um, for which we got uh, around like uh, 30 to uh, 40 kilopascals of pressure drop. So um, the flow rate is much lower compared to conventional solutions, but the pressure drop is typically much higher. Um, so um, for uh, this particular design, we got uh, around, uh, around like uh, 30 kilopascals of pressure drop, but um, that is something which we uh, can optimize for. So uh, for example, we have uh, done some like studies based on like uh, the placement of the inlet or the outlet ports of these 3D printed attachments we do, we can actually control the um, 
pressure drop by like uh, say for example splitting the flow rate into different zones in the device um so there is an interesting trade off study there but uh, the basic uh, basic idea is that like the uh, flow rates are typically much higher much lower than the conventional solutions but at the cost of an increased pressure drop yeah yeah makes sense makes sense okay uh, thank you for so i think we